Amen. Well, I'm going to invite to the platform uh, Pastor Bev and Butch, if you would come, and Pastor Liz and Ryan, if you would come up onto the platform. Transitions are wonderful when they're a God thing. Let me, let me just say that again. Transitions are wonderful when they're a God thing. Yeah. Amen? And uh, how many know that individuals are not ours to hold on to? In the kingdom of God, they belong to him. Even our children. Some of the wives don't like to hear that. But even our children, they belong to the Lord. And if he should move them, it's okay. And so Pastor Bev has been with us for 15 years. Most of you uh, have enjoyed and appreciated her ministry over the 15 years. And we have thanked her. We had a banquet for her um, just not too long ago. And uh, uh, just so appreciate she and Butch. They are true servants of God. And at this point and stage in their life, they just felt like it was time to step out here. And uh, they're really not sure what they're going to do. So we ask you to keep praying for them that the Lord would direct them. And would you just join me in giving a, a heartfelt, warm thank you to Pastor Bev for 15 years here in service. Amen. So, <laughs> speech, speech, she'll, she'll have an opportunity. So, unbeknownst to us, uh, with the Lord stirring Bev's, Pastor Bev's heart, that the Lord brought Ryan and Liz to Chambersburg uh, a year and a half ago. And they have been here, and the Lord's stirring their hearts. And um, not until just recently did they feel like they wanted to jump back in ministry. They have been in ministry for, uh, since they left Bible College at Valley Forge. Uh, they've been in um, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, been in Phoenix, Arizona, been in Florida, and God brought him back to Chambersburg. Uh, Liz's family is here. So the Lord just orchestrated this so beautifully, and uh, it just confirms in my heart again that uh, Beverly stepping away was the Lord's, the Lord's doing. And uh, we hate that, you know, we hate that. Uh, but we also want to just honor what God's doing in somebody's heart and life. And as much as we'd like to keep Pastor Bev, we wouldn't want to keep her from what God has for her. Amen? Amen. And so that's kind of what's happening here in the trans transition, and we're honored. So this is Ryan and their son, David, and uh, he's just a handsome little guy. Look at that. Aww. So we want to install our new children's pastor. I'm going to hand this baton to you right now, Beverly, for just a moment. And today we're honored to be able to install Pastor Elizabeth Applegarth as our children's pastor. We believe her call to Christian life is for such a time as this. And we receive her family and their ministry into this fellowship as a gift from the Lord. Elizabeth, we call her Liz. You're welcome to call her Pastor Liz, but... Uh, her official name is Elizabeth, so we're doing an official ceremony. We'll call her Elizabeth today. Elizabeth, do you solemnly promise that by the assistance of the grace of God and the Holy Spirit, you will endeavor to faithfully discharge the duties which will fall to you as children's pastor of this congregation? And will you promise to be careful to maintain a godly example of the life before God and man? If so, would you answer, with the Lord's help, I will. Amen. To you, congregation, do you promise to care for the Applegarth family as your own and as a gift from the Lord to this congregation? And when the Lord shall direct you to come alongside of them to serve as unto the Lord the best of your ability, if that is your wish, would you please answer, with the Lord's help, we will. With the Lord's help, we will. Amen. Pastor Bev. Would you welcome Liz and entrust the Ministry of Christian Life kids to her? Hand her the baton as you speak and then lay your hands on her after you share whatever you'd like to share with her. 
and then I'm going to ask you to pray over her. How many of you know this is the way the kingdom should go? Amen. Right? Liz, I want to welcome you to Christian Life Church and, and as the role that you're taking here. And I want you to know that this rule was not to be taken lightly. It's, we're working for the kingdom of God. And I'm going to entrust you with these children. God has placed you here because he's entrusted you. So and I want you to, I want to entrust you to continue to raise these kids to be warriors for God and make them um, spiritual champions and disciplers and train them how to really pray and know the power of healing and, and, and a lot of them do and and so don't take this lightly but God's going to use you he's called you here and and you're going to go to the next level so Liz I'm going to pass this baton to you as you run the race with the with the team here and you're going to do it strong and mighty so we bless you we bless you and God's going to do great things so I want you to raise your hands towards Liz and her husband, and we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have appointed Pastor Liz at a time such as this. And God, I ask that you would bless her and her family, and you would anoint her from her head to her toe, God. Lord, I pray that you would take her to the new level, and a new level that she doesn't even know about, God. Lord, take her deep, Lord, and take her deep with the children. And God, we pray the blessings over them, Lord, and their family, and with health and prosperity, God. Father, Lord, direct their paths, and let their yes be yes, and their no's be no's. God. So, Father, we ask that you would just protect them, Lord, and, and use them mightily, Lord. Lord, as they, as they lay hands on the children, that the children would get filled with the Holy Spirit, God. Lord, that they would bring the revival that, that you said that is coming in the children, God. So, Lord, let them be in that mix, Lord, God. Use them mightily. So, Father, we ask that you would just bless them. And, Lord, today you smile upon them, and you yeah. say it is yeah. well. You smile yes. upon them today, God. So, Father, we just thank you for them and bless them. And, and oh my, let your showers of blessing just overflow them today, God. Lord, and give them favor in areas that they have been asking for, that if they have yeah, been waiting yeah, for. You've already yeah. given them favor in one, yeah. but Lord, you're going to give them more favors, Jesus. Lord, the blessings are going to keep coming. So, Father, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, I do pronounce and declare that Elizabeth Applegarth is duly constituted the children's pastor of this congregation this eighth day of September 2019. She actually started September 1st, but today it's official. Would you welcome her to our congregation? Join me as I would pray as well. Father, in every age you've chosen servants to speak your word and to lead your people. So we thank you for Elizabeth, our sister, called and set apart by you. Father, I ask that you'd grant her a humble spirit to lead and train our children. A teachable spirit to always be sitting at your feet. A servant's heart to model the Lord's example to the very impressionable students that you have put in her care. May her knees continually be bent in prayer, depending on you for the results in her ministry. And above all, would you fill her heart with agape love of the Father, so that our young students would know unconditional love. Fill her with a fresh touch, a baptism, an overwhelming, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, to empower her to do the work of the ministry in your strength, and not her own. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Liz, I want to present to you a servant's towel. It's just engraves. It's called to be a servant. 
And as you position yourself as a servant here at Christian Life Church, I want to present this to you. May the Lord enable us to serve well together for the sake of the kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome. Thank you, brother. Amen. God bless you, Butch. Amen. Amen. Dale just got back from Africa. I, I failed to remember all the statistics. I asked him, so how was the trip? And the one that I remember was 9,600 and some odd people gave their heart to Jesus Christ. 9,600 some souls. Isn't that incredible? Uh, thousands were healed. Thousands filled with the Holy Ghost. And God is still on the throne. He's still touching hearts and lives. Amen? Amen. Looking forward to this time. I really believe, by the way, the cards that we've handed out today and we have exchanged the pink and blue cards are a grassroot, are an undertow to what's going to happen this week. In other words, that your praying for one another is literally setting them up for the success of the Holy Ghost this week when the evangelist comes. And I'm believing God to do something grassroots in all of our lives, to do something fresh, something new. If you know people who need to be healed, people who need to be saved, this is a great place for them to be. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit and you've wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, this is a great place to be that week. And I trust that you'll make time to be here. Well, let's jump into our series. This is the second part. I actually broke the first session up into two separate parts. And then this one is a, a family in peace. How many know peace is a good thing? How many know peace is a good thing? Uh, one, of, one of the worst things is when there's tension in the home. Uh, my wife and I, over the years, have had our tense times. Uh, we don't fight, we just have intimate fellowship. Yeah, so, so we all have those, don't we? We all have those times in, in life where it, we just get rubbed the wrong way or whatever. So I'm today hoping that we can unpack some things that would help us all to have a happy home. And uh, I believe it's possible by the truth and the word of God. So Lord... Open your word to our heart today and help us to receive uh, instruction and wisdom and counsel for our lives, for our families, for our marriages, that you would be honored in all that's said and done and all God's people said, amen. <clears throat> so how do we have a peaceful home? How do we restore harmony in the home. I, I want to say that the home should be a place of peace. The world is a hard place to live. And for a husband or a wife or children to have to go home only to find more turmoil is not the will of God. If you call yourself a Christian family, your home ought to be a place of peace. And so I pray that over all of us today, before we even get started, that the Lord would allow your home to be a place of peace. Mark chapter 3, verse 25, simply says this, A home divided against itself is doomed. A house that has division in it, is destined for disaster. There has to be unity in the home. And I, I think we all know the truth of this statement in Mark 3. In fact, some of you may be living out that statement in your home. Uh, maybe your house is a place where there is division in the home. You're feeling the destruction in your home. 
tension with husband, wife, children, whatever it might be. There's tension in the home. The scripture is filled with uh, principles to help us to learn to get along as human beings and as families within the home unit. So let's see what we can do to change the atmosphere in a home today that perhaps is not experiencing peace. And maybe you're here today and you are a house of peace. Then there might be some principles you can learn when tension might visit your home. And it's probably inevitable that tension would visit our homes. It's part of human nature that we, we rub each other. Uh, we all have likes and dislikes. We have personalities. And it causes tension. Today, we want to look at three aspects of conflict. The first one is the reason for conflict. What does the Bible say is the reason for conflict in our home? I'm glad you asked, because if we look to James chapter 4, the first couple of verses, this is my wife's favorite book, the book of James. It's such a practical book. James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? This is from the new uh, contemporary version, so I apologize for those of you that are reading from a King James or an NIV. But it has an interesting arrangement of words here. Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that war within you. You want things, but you don't have them. So you are ready to kill and are jealous of other people, but you still cannot get what you want, so you argue and fight. Wow, how many know that's a tumultuous house? The root in this verse is really obvious, isn't it? That we all have things that we want. We want to get our way. Kind of like spoiled little kids sometimes. Even as adults. Uh, don't elbow your husband or wife right now. But even as adults, we, we have those moments where we're spoiled and there's something that we want. And so we fuss about it. We argue about it. We, we fret about it. And James is telling us, the Holy Spirit, through James penning these words, is telling us that the reason we fight in our homes is because we're, we're not working together. We're working independently and trying to get our own way. So... What I want is not what you want, and what you want is not what I want, and so we end up having a fight. We have competing needs and interests. When you got married, you both had your unspoken expectations. Uh, some of you that have been married for a long time, I just want to see a show of hands. Uh, when, how many of you had some ridiculous expectations when you went into marriage that you the lights went on later on. My wife's hand quickly went up. Um, yeah, we, we have certain expectations going into marriage, and we realize real quickly that, okay, maybe I need to lower my level of expectation a little bit because we're, de you know, my wife didn't marry Jesus. I know some of you are so shocked right now. But she didn't marry Jesus, she married Joseph. The father of Jesus. No, no, I'm just kidding. But she, she married Joseph. And Joseph came with lots of baggage. You know why he came with lots of baggage? Because he was raised in a family with lots of baggage. Which was raised in a family with lots of baggage. And it goes clear back to our ancestors, Adam and Eve. We all have sinful natures, right? And we, we bring into marriage baggage. And so a wife comes in and she's learned this style of living in her home. And a husband comes in, he's learned this style of living in her home. And so he's expecting her to understand the way he was born and raised. And she's understand, expecting him to understand it. And they get together and their ex expectations collide. And sometimes very, very, very quickly. And there are some marriages that go through their whole life cycle and never figure it out. That their expectations are wrong. And perhaps not even biblical. And there has to be a blending of that. And today, I hope to help you get to the place where we can do that. Most of the expectations we have going into marriage are highly unrealistic. And I don't want to spend too much time with this first point. We can just simply say the reason for marriage is we have our own desires. 
and not necessarily the best interest of our spouse or children or parents or whatever your issue might be. The second point is the reactions to conflict. Uh, there are five basic ways to react to conflict. The first one is my way. I win. Now, some of you in your marriage are, are like this. You win at all cost. I assert my will until you give in. I'm totally right. You're totally wrong. And some of you fight this way in your marriage until you win. You just keep hammering and hammering, taunting, provoking, antagonizing until you win. The second one is no way. This way says, I am not going to fight. I'm just going to withdraw. I'm going to go crawl in my hole, and I'm not going to fight with you. We might call this the flight syndrome. Uh, I, I, I back away from the conflict. I ignore the problem, and I avoid confrontation at all costs. How many know that doesn't mean the confrontation is gone? The confrontation is there. You just haven't dealt with it yet. And by the way, by the way, the longer you choose to not deal with conflict, the greater the conflict becomes. It's like the, uh, uh, I don't know where we got it from, but sweeping the dirt under the carpet. Uh, the company's coming, so you open up the corner of the carpet and you sweep the dirt under so it looks clean. But underneath, it's still dirt. And if we let it pile up long enough, there's going to be a hump in the carpet. And some of you have a hump in your marriage because uh, you've let too much dirt be piled up under the carpet. The third way is your way. I give in and roll over and play dead. All right, fine. You won. You do, do what you want. And, and I, I, I want your approval, so I pretend like I like what you're saying. I become a doormat, and uh, I'll always give in to whatever you wish. It's always your way. Wow. It's very peaceful that way. There's a level of peace. Um, but eventually, the one who continually gives in and says, okay, have it your way, is going to get fed up with that. And whether it's being expressed or not, there will be resentment that builds up in the heart towards the one that they're giving constantly into. And so, uh, approaching conflict with Okay, you win all the time isn't a healthy way to deal with it either. The other way, the fourth way, is halfway, where a little bit of compromise is happening, and both giving in a little bit. Now, we, we might look at this and say, well, that's a good way to handle conflict. But the problem with that is, is who, who's going to give in, and how much are they going to give in, and how much are you going to compromise? And honestly, in this fourth one, you may both walk away from handling the conflict and still not feel resolved or feel uh, appreciative of the end result. Because she gave 50, he gave 50, and so we go away feeling 50. Uh, feeling like the marriage is only 50% healthy. The last way I want to suggest is perhaps the healthiest, and it's our way. This is the best way to work at conflict. Uh, we work out mutual goals together. What are you feeling about this? Well, this is what I'm feeling about that. Well, I'm not really feeling what you're feeling. Okay, well, can we pray about this? Can we bring the Lord into this conflict, and can we ask the Holy Spirit... What might be the best way for us to handle this? Now, I understand that that formula right there may be, may be very foreign to some of you. But listen, if you continue doing things the way you've always done them, you're going to continue to get the results you've always got. Right? And so if you want to make a change in the peace atmosphere of your home, you have to make some adjustments. And that is submitting these things to one another and then submitting them to the Lord and asking the Holy Spirit to give you direction. This is true of married couples. It's true for conflicts between parents and kids and just about any other relationship you can think of. This idea of mutually coming to a goal, an understanding, and listen, catch this this morning. 
This point, this fifth one here, is not so much about you getting your way or them getting their way, but us together having his way. There is a way that seems right unto a man, the scripture says, but the end of that way is death, destruction. So the scripture tells us that. But when we bring our hearts together and we submit to one another out of reverence to the Lord, and there it is, the passage of scripture, we reverently submit ourselves, submit ourselves unto the Lord, then the Lord can step in by the power of the Holy Spirit and bring resolution in our home. And you can both walk away from that and feel like, ah. And we can say, it seemed good to us and the Holy Ghost. And it works. And it's a pleasurable way to keep peace in your home. The third aspect of conflict is the resolution. I mean, you know we all want resolution when there's conflict in the home. Resolution. Let me give you eight biblical steps to resolve conflict in your home. First of all, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you'll probably never have a true spirit-led resolution in your home. Because unless Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, you're simply doing things out of your mindset, what you know to be right, what you know to be wrong, what you know should be the way. And when Jesus Christ comes into your life, hear me this morning, some of you are here and don't know Jesus as a personal Savior. If you don't know Jesus as a personal Savior and have not made him Lord of your life, your, your spirit man has not been born again. Now, what do you mean by that, preacher? I mean that your spirit man is the real you. In other words, this body one day is going to decay. It's going to go into the grave. That's not the real you. This is just a tent that you're living in. So we have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotion. And the spirit is that eternal part of you. And when you were born, you were born with a sinful nature, a carnal nature, that will constantly do wrong until it is born again. Well, how do I get born again? Do I have to go back inside my mother's womb? One of the men in Scripture, Nicodemus, came to Jesus and said, do I got to go back into my mother's womb? Well, no, that's not what we're talking about. But we have to take our spirit and submit it to the Lord and ask Him to redeem or to change, to transform the, the, the being that's inside of us to become in His likeness. And it's this process that we refer to as salvation or simply being born again. So asking Jesus Christ, Father, I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that Jesus Christ came to this planet. He died on the cross. He shed his blood so that I can receive forgiveness. All I have to do is ask him to come into my heart. It is by grace that you're saved through faith. God's grace, meaning he's, 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 not, he's given you something that you didn't deserve. None of us in this room deserve salvation, but he gave it to us. And it's by faith we step in this. See, I, I, I can't hand you a card that tells you you're saved. It's something that happens inside, and only you know when your spirit bears witness with the Spirit of God that came in. And then you begin to produce fruit in your life. Where once you had a foul mouth, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit that is now living inside of you will say to you, Hey, listen, that word you just used is not mine. That's not the way I speak in my kingdom. The Holy Spirit will start to, we call, you use the word convict. He starts telling you that what you're doing is wrong. Maybe you're having sex with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or the way you talk to your parents, whatever it might be. Whatever your issue is, the Holy Spirit will start to bring conviction in your life and you'll say, man, this is not right. I need to change my ways. And, and the Holy Spirit's very gentle with you. And you know that you're a child of God when the Holy Spirit starts to communicate with you that way. It bears witness with your spirit. So the first way, the first point in, in bringing resolution to conflict and having peace in your home is you've got to be a Christian. You've got to be a follower of Jesus Christ because then you can invite the presence of God into your home and he can help you with the resolution. How many can say amen to that? Amen. amen. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, it's as simple as you saying, Father, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus Christ to come in and change my heart. Would you forgive me today? I want to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's the key, being a follower of Jesus Christ. And you can start opening the Bible and you, you read the New Testament. Read John about four times. And you just say, I want to do what Jesus is doing. I want to do what Jesus is doing. I want to do what Jesus is doing. And as you do that, the Holy Spirit will enable you 
to be the child of God that he wants you to be. The second point is talk to God about it. Now, I understand we just referred to this, but if you're here today and you're already a believer, I wonder how many of us talk to God about the issues in our home. Do you talk to God about how you're upset at your wife or you're upset at your husband, you're upset at your kids? God, would you help me? Before you talk to the person you're upset with, it might be wise for you, in fact, not might be, it is wise for you to go to God and say, God, I'm really upset. I'm t- in fact, I'm just angry at this person. You know, recently, I had a situation where, boy, uh, there was a thing that just infuriated me. Any, anybody in here ever get infuriated? Okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't the only one on the planet. But I, I got infuriated one day, and, and, and I knew that I needed to talk to the person that I was infuriated at, but I, 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 needed, I was so infuriated, I needed two days to talk to Jesus. Because I knew that if I had talked to them prior to talking to Jesus, and I really had to talk to Jesus, that what came out of my mouth would not have been wholesome and godly and edifying and building up. And so I had two days where I had to talk to Jesus about it. And uh, finally I was able to speak with a heart of love and compassion and share my frustration um, and, and get it off my chest. And it was, it's all good. But we have to talk to Jesus first. And by the way, sometimes when you talk to Jesus, he may not have you talk to the person at all. You might settle it right there at the throne of grace. Amen. He, he, he might just deal with, he might say, you know what? You're angry at that person, but what happened is you're looking in the mirror at yourself. You're really the issue. Ooh, okay, God, right? But James tells us that you argue and fight. You do not get what you want because you do not ask God. See, there it is. You didn't get what you wanted because you didn't ask God. Sometimes the things we're asking for, things we're wanting, things we're desiring, only he can fill that place in our heart. Sometimes there's issues where men are expecting their wives to, to fulfill this longing in their heart when only God can do that, and vice versa. Women expecting their husbands to fulfill that place in their heart. I like to say there's a God-shaped void in our hearts, and only God can fill that space. Uh, It's not your husband. It's not a boyfriend. It's not having children. It's not a job. It's not a promotion. Only God can fill that place in your heart. I don't know about you, but I've noticed over the years that when there's something that I'm wanting and I perhaps haven't even communicated what I wanted well, I start to get angry inside. There's just a, it's like a boiler. It just starts getting, uh, and I notice that my words are curt to people. They're sharp, and thank God for Debbie, the Holy Spirit in my home, uh, because sometimes she'll just say to me, Joe, Joe, listen to the way you're talking. Ooh. Do, do I get a witness with anybody this morning? It's, 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 it's like a boiler. It just builds up. You, you, you can't really know it's building up until all of a sudden, <laughs> just junk comes out. And I, I have had to go and apologize to so many people. It's pathetic. Would you, you forgive me? I, I spoke. I spoke harshly. I said something I shouldn't have said. Would you forgive me? And and that's what should happen, by the way. You don't let your words go unchecked. Because next time it's easier for you just to throw it out again. But when you know you got to go apologize to someone, that's that's not a fun chore. Right? So that anger is kind of like a warning sign for me when I start feeling frustrated. Go, up, oh, up, oh, something's wrong. I'm expecting somebody else to do something that probably only he can do. It ought to be a, a great indicator for us. Thirdly, analyze the problem. Ask yourself, how much of this problem is my fault? Now, that might be revolutionary <laughs> to some of us here today. You know, how much of this is my fault? What have I done to provoke this? Before you start accusing, blaming, or attacking, Jesus says, check yourself out. Matthew 7, listen to this translation, the message translation. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. 
You have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your face is distorted by contempt. Wow. Wow. So get out the mirror and take a good look at yourself. So take a good look at yourself. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to do. By the way, this is, this is a great mirror, right? You get the mirror out, and boy, it shows us things about ourselves that sometimes is not so ugly, and other times it's, wow, God, thank you that you're working that in my life. That's awesome that you're working that in my life. I, I've also noticed that it's really hard to worship effectively when I haven't resolved the issues in my heart. Because listen, while, uh, while I'm down here and I'm trying to worship, I got my hands raised and the Holy Spirit says, Hey, <laughs> remember what you said to your wife this morning? Oh, would you be quiet? I'm trying to worship. I love you, Lord. And he says, you do? Why don't you love your wife? Oh, please be quiet. I'm trying to worship. <laughs> oh, God, you're so awesome. Yes, I am. And if you don't repent, I'm going to strike you, right? <laughs> like, you know. See, a true follower of Jesus Christ has this wonderful gift called the Holy Spirit. Amen. And he's there to lead and to guide us into all truth. And he's awesome. Uh, we, we ought to be thanking God for his Holy Spirit that he's given us. Uh, we're, on Wednesday night, we're doing a book, working through a book called Spirit-Filled Jesus. And it's made me, every once in a while, the Holy Spirit just reminds me of this. To start every day, waking up, saying, Holy Spirit, good morning. It's like saying, good morning, God. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Would you open my heart and my mind to you today? Whatever you're wanting to do through me today, would you do that? Holy Spirit, make me like Jesus today. I mean, no, life would be pretty good if we started every day like that. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us, right? The fourth thing is schedule a peace conference. This is just simply having a face-to-face, -face, sit-down conference. Because conflict seldom resolve, is resolved accidentally. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, So when you offer your gift to God at the altar, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar, go and make peace with that person, and then come and offer your gift. You know, brothers and sisters have something against you. Maybe it's in your home, whatever it is. He's saying, listen, when you come to the house of worship, deal with your issues. So when you come to the, you know, we, we can offer God all we want, but if it's not, if it's done at an unresolved heart, he says, you might as, might as well just leave it and go fix things before you try offering it to me. Because I, I think the rest of this verse, if we could unpack it, it would probably say to us that God's not receiving your gift because you haven't resolved the issue yet. And why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because we're the body of Christ. And when we don't resolve issues, we're, we're hindering his body. Right? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, we must glorify God in our bodies and in his body. It's important that we clear the air because if we don't, we're affecting his body. Your issue isn't just your issue. Your issue becomes our issue because we're the body of Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, you're the body of Christ. And I hope you really understand that. And so scheduling a peace conference. You know, I heard one marriage counselor say that if it's a, you know it's going to be a really heated conversation with your spouse, take her or him out to a restaurant and sit in a busy restaurant so that you can't raise your voice at each other. Otherwise, you'd make a spectacle. And if you know you can't control yourself in the restaurant, stay home. Because they'll recognize you as one of the members of Christian Life Church and don't disgrace the body of Christ that way. But when we get out in public and we 
have a conference with one another, we can speak in a, a healthy tone, an honoring tone to one another. And before you meet or when you meet, start your meeting with prayer. God, we, we know that there's conflict in our hearts towards one another. Holy Spirit, we invite you at this table to come and speak to us. Speak to my heart. Speak to my partner's heart. So that when this night is done, we can say the Holy Spirit has come and he's changed our hearts that we can be united again. This conference is not a time to blame or unload, but a time to find resolution. I think this is probably the big thing for me. It's finding a way that most important, aside from you getting your way, that is secondary. Primarily, the most important thing is we want to preserve the relationship. By the way, our relationships are the only thing you're going to bring to eternity with you. Your job, your house, your cars, your land, your titles, all of that stays here. It goes to the grave. I've done a lot of funerals in my day, and I've never seen U-Hauls following the casket to the graveyard. All of it stays here. Relationships will meet us on the other side. And so ultimately, the most important thing is restoring and, and preserving is probably the best word, a relationship. That when I go into the fight, I'm not wanting them to, to see my way and I'm going to tell them how it is. No, I, I, my, if, I could, if I could impose that same intensity to the preservation of the relationship, I believe it will be a healthy result. And God would be honored with that. The fifth one is establish ground rules. Simply said, fight fair. How many know there's a right way to fight and a wrong way to fight? You know, even in boxing matches, they have rules. Even in MMA, they have rules. In wrestling, they have rules. And why shouldn't it be any different when it comes to fighting in your marriage? It's not that it's wrong to fight. It's wrong to fight unfair, and it's wrong to fight with the, without using the right principles. We're all going to fight, but when you fight, do it the right way. So never compare. Have you ever used the words, I wish you were like, dot, dot, dot. You're just like your mother. Because it's unfair to, be, to compare any of us to anybody else, right? You're not your mother. You're not your father. You're not your brother. I was sharing Wednesday night. We had a, a couple that years ago came here to interview for a youth ministry position. And uh, the, the young man, he was just excited about ministry. He was, he was over the top excited. He kind of had an evangelist pers evangelistic personality um, where they just stretch everything. And his wife was just very quiet. And so I uh, remember my wife asking, so tell us about you. Tell us your story and you know, about your marriage. And, and the young gal said, well, we, we grew up in a small town. And uh, I really was in love with his brother. And he got married to someone else. So he was the only one left. How many know that's a marriage that's going to just skyrocket to success, right? And she's saying this right in front of him, and he was like totally oblivious, like, yeah, I'm so glad I got her, and I'm thinking, oh, buddy. Uh, needless to say, we didn't hire them, but um, <laughs> never condemn uh, is the second one. Don't use phrases like, you're always, or, or you never. Some of you grew up with this. This kind of language being spoken over your life. You always, you never, you ought to, you should, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, right? We, we heard those screamed in our ears perhaps growing up. And let me just give you one little tool that might really help. If you stop using the word you at the beginning of every sentence and you use the word I. Picture it this way. When you use the word you 
It's like you throwing a flaming arrow at the person you're conversing with. When you use the word I, you turn it around and you begin to express something from your heart that's meaningful. I need you to know that right now I'm feeling really hurt because of what was said. I think I would, I think I would feel better if I would feel better if we communicated this way. I, I, you arrow, I distinguish the arrow, the flame that's there. All right? Third, never, never command. Been around a few husbands that are like this, and maybe there's some wives out there, I don't know. Don't try to end an argument with force. I command you, woman, you will submit to me. Just listen to that. Can anybody help me and say, that's ugly? That's, that's really ugly. Don't try to parent your spouse. Fourth, never challenge. By this, I mean don't threaten. Y you know what it's like when you threaten somebody. It's like the sign that says, don't touch, the paint is wet. I wonder if it's dry yet. Nope. That's what a threat is like. It's like, I dare you to touch the paint. You do that again, woman, I'm, get, I'm leaving. It's a threat. There are three, three common threats in marriage. One is that Couples often use sex as a threat. Okay, if you don't buy me that new kitchen appliance, then I am not having sex with you for the next month. And we're chuckling, but it really goes on. Two weeks into it, I told you, get away from me. We are not having sex for a month. Do you get it? You've got two more weeks. Get me the appliance. Sometimes it's money. We fight over money. We threaten with money. Uh, we, we, we have allowances. Whatever systems you use, you know, we threaten with money. Uh, or we, we threaten with this terrible, terrible word, divorce. If you could rule those three weapons out in your marriage, you would be on your way to a very mature, healthy marriage. Don't ever threaten one another with sex, money, or divorce. And never contradict. Uh, this is probably my greatest problem. I drive my wife crazy with this one. The Holy Spirit somehow has not helped me to tame my tongue. Um, type A personalities, we, we, we probably do this one a lot. It's because we know what needs to be done and we just get to the point and we just, and we snip off. And my, my wife gets frustrated because she'll be, opening her heart and telling me how she feels, and in the middle of it, I'll tell her how she feels. When reality is, if we learn to wait our turn, let your wife, let your husband, some of you have very chatty wives, and so they explain their feelings with uh, pontificating long paragraphs. And as a husband, you're thinking, so you're angry. <laughs> Others of you have husbands that Drone on. Uh, stop shaking your heads. I don't want to see this. 
And, she, and, and they drone on and on. And the wife just simply says, so you want to have sex? But often as we jump in and contradict what the person is saying, what we're saying to them is, I don't value what you're feeling right now. I don't value how you're processing this. And when I tell you that I struggle with this, I mean I struggle with this. Would you pray for your pastor that the Lord would help him with this issue? Would somebody do that for me? And pastor, you, pastor, you need help. Amen. And never confuse. You're in the middle of fighting about one thing, and uh, it's kind of a diversion tactic. You bring up something totally unrelated. Oh, I know why you're doing this, because three months ago when you did whatever, and it's, it gets muddy it gets confusing and we just stick with the issue what is the issue bring it back to the issue and proverbs tells us the fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left wow i've i've heard many many husbands say that I've injured my family so much that my kids want nothing to do with me. My wife is still living in the house because she has nowhere better to go. But they want nothing to do with me because I've just lived my life selfishly. And listen, at the end of life, when you're living by yourself, it hits you in the head like a brick. Maybe like a sledgehammer. You've lived so selfishly and nobody wants to be around you. Is it time to look in the mirror and realize that you've got to change some things in your life? Stop being so selfish and allow the Holy Spirit to change your heart. Be, be generous. Be gracious. Be loving. Be caring. Compassionate. Humble. When you live with people like this that are just on edge all the time, very selfish and very greedy, you realize they have hot buttons. And what your family does is they walk around, we call it walking on eggshells. We, we tiptoe around the person like, oh, don't say that. Dad's going to get really mad and you know what it's going to be like in the house tonight. And I want you to think about that for a moment if that's you. You literally are holding your family hostage to your emotional immaturity. And can you just see that for what it is? It's emotional immaturity. And you've, you've held your spouse, your children captive to your way of living. The sixth one is Switch your focus. Move the attention away from yourself and place the attention on other people. If James says we're always fighting because we didn't get what we wanted, well, what if you flipped the coin and asked, what does the other person want? What does the other person need? Philippians 2, verse 4 and 5, each of you should look not only on your own interests, so it's saying that it's okay to look on your own interests, but don't just stop there. Don't make it all about you, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be that, uh, the same as that of Christ Jesus. And what was Christ Jesus? Jesus Christ came to serve, not to be served. He came to give himself. So ask yourself, am I serving? Am I giving myself as a ransom for my family? Am I sacrificing? His attitude was that of a servant. What can you do to meet the person's needs? You're, if you're angry all the time, you're probably way too preoccupied with your issues or your needs. And so you need to focus. That's why these prayer cards I'm handing, we, 
we've handed out are so key because it's helping us to get off of ourself. Sometime in our prayer closet, all we do is focus on ourselves. God bless me. God help me. God do this. God do that. We give God this long list. And now we're asking God to do something for somebody else. It's a biblical principle to give the attention to someone else. If you want a, a magical sentence that clears up so many of the conflicts in our home, listen to this. If you could write this down, this is just a magical sentence. will save so many conflicts in your home. It's simply this, e this easy. I'm sorry. I was only thinking of myself. I'm sorry. I was only thinking of myself. Or how about just simply, I'm sorry, I was wrong. What can we do to work on this? When's the last time you apologized to somebody? We mentioned it earlier, it really is a difficult thing. And let me, let me add this, the Holy Spirit just spoke this to my heart. If you're having a hard time apologizing to somebody, then you have a huge issue with pride. Pride is the thing that keeps you from humbling yourself to say, I'm sorry. And so, forget the sorry issue. You may just want to get along with God and have God deal with your prideful heart. You know, the Bible says that God resists the proud, but he draws near to the humble. So, if you have a Christian home and you're wanting to have the, the Spirit of God in your home, it doesn't matter how much you want it. If you're walking in pride, I, I always think of that word, resist the proud, as... In football, they call it a stiff arm. You don't, don't allow it to get close. God's resisting you. I'm not even going to let you in my presence. I'm going to resist you. But he draw. listen to this. He's keeping you from getting to him. When we walk humbly, he comes to you. He draws near to the humble. I don't know about you, but I want God's presence to draw near to me. Anybody like that here? The only way to do that is to humble ourselves. Our level of humility will determine our level of unity in the church and in our home. And our level of unity will determine how much of the power and the presence of God is released in this house. Our level of humility will determine the level of our unity. And the level of our unity will determine the power and the presence. I hope that when I'm gone from this planet, some of you that are still alive... If you forget everything else I said, you would remember that one statement. Our level of humility will determine our level of unity. And our level of unity will determine the power and the presence of God in our lives personally and in the church corporately. Seventh, ask for advice. Why is it when we have spiritual problems, we... We have issues coming and asking for help. If you have a health problem, we go to the doctor to get help. If you have legal problems, you, you hire a lawyer. If you have financial problems, you, you talk to someone that has some financial savvy and you get some help. If you have relational problems, you, you get a counselor and they help you. Proverbs 12 says, fools think they need no advice, but the wise listen to others. Every once in a while, I, I don't consider myself the wisest person in the world, but every once in a while, someone in the church will call me up and say, Pastor, can I come in and talk to you? Uh, we're, we have some things that we're trying to resolve in our home, some goals that we want to do, and we're having a, can I just run them by you? And they have been so few and so far between that when they happen, I'm just like, wow, God, this is, this is amazing that this person understands the value of getting counsel from somebody else. By the way, when you're getting counsel, get godly counsel. We have so many people running to the gals at work or the guys at work and say, yeah, my wife, she's a witch and, you know, she's doing this. And they're like, man, I dump her. Go home and slap her in the head and tell her to get out. Yeah, not so godly. 
And the last, don't give up. I've heard over and over again married couples that have been in this church, seasoned married couples, we might say, that would simply say to us, well, you, younger couples, uh, don't give up. Don't throw the towel in too quick. You can work through your issues. Anybody in here been married over 35 years? Raise your hand really high. In fact, stand up if you've been married over 35 years. Wow. You younger married couples, would you give them a hand? Now, I know many of you can be seated. I know many of these families that just stood up, and I promise you they had issues. That cookie is... <laughs> They've had issues. I only pointed her out because she was chuckling. I had nothing to say to her. But listen, we all have issues, and you can work it out if you invite Jesus in the home and fight fair. Can you say amen? amen? If you're here with your spouse this morning, would you just clasp hands and ask my beautiful bride to come? Doesn't she look beautiful? On four hours of sleep last night, <laughs> she still looks hot. <laughs> Father, We know that you are desiring to have godly offspring, sons and daughters that reflect the heart of the king. And as we worked through this issue of having peace in our home today, there are areas that touched our heart. And we thought, ah, that's me. That's where I need to change. I need to do this. I need to change that. And so we invite Holy Spirit, you to come into our marriage, and would you help us to communicate healthy to one another, to bring resolution, and at all costs, preserve this relationship. When we gave our hearts to one another, we did it before you. We did it before you. We said, so help me God. So we say that again here today. So help me God. So help me God, help me God to be a godly husband to my wife. Help us in this room to be godly to one another. May the children say, so help me God to be honoring to my mother and father. Uh, and, and to be submissive to them. And wives submissive to the husbands and husbands loving and caring for their wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We ask you, God, to let these relationships in this room and the sound of my voice, perhaps those watching online, to be relationships that are honoring to the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, when we get on the other side of the glory, we'll thank you and give you all the praise for allowing your Holy Spirit to work in and through us. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen. 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 Lord bless you. Keep you, make his face to shine upon you. Oh, that's nice.